G'day, folks. Talk to Martin Stewart, a fierce advocate in the disability sector on all things social reform. And especially in the section of vision impairment. He was born blind. And we talk about his life from the start to where he's at now. And in the middle, and talking about that, is where he got his other disability, acquired disability, double disability, with a run-in with a tram. Horrific. But life kept on moving, persevered, and he's still advocating and pushing forward for people in the disability sector. It's a great voice. Push, move, motivate. Great guy. I want to thank our sponsors, Permaville Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four walls right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So righto, let's get into it. Martin, mate, thanks for yes, finally hello. having hello. a yarn a, a yarn with us. Like I knew it's we were supposed to peg it in that time last year, but then the weather didn't didn't favour the planes up in that Brisbane meeting that that year. So oh, it's good to finally look what's happened since then. With myself, mate. Oh, well, with me, a lot's been going on, mate. So you know, there's been with the world. Oh, with the world. Yeah, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Yeah. It's thrown That's everybody in, into a spin. So, and, you yeah. know, I just want, and I want to just say, you know, you're the first, the first guest to come in on this medium that I'm, you know, talking through the computer and recording it all and just going to yeah. see how it goes, mate. But, um, yeah, you're looking sharp, brother. Thank you. Yeah, feeling yeah. okay. You good? Mate, I'm going all right amongst this, you know, Corona, COVID nineteen yeah, madness, yeah. and it's you know it's pretty full on. We're pretty lucky in Australia compared to the rest of the world. But mate, you guys down in Victoria are starting to spike up again, eh? Yeah, we're 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 making the country nervous. I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think so, mate. But yeah, just want to kick it off. Martin, with um, just who you are and where you're from and where your roots are. So, yeah, I came from Curry Curry in New South Wales, Hunter Valley area. I'm currently working as the National Advocacy Officer for Blind Citizens Australia. I was the 2018 Blind Australian of the Year, and I'm an all-round good guy. What can I say? <laughs> um, I've travelled a bit. Yep. I've worked in various areas and sectors, industry relations, 14 years president of a union. That's so. I've right. dealt with public transport and all kinds of other matters. I'm here for one reason only, and that is to improve our world for particularly for people with disabilities. I have an acquired disability as well as one that I was born with. I am totally blind, which I was born with and have acquired the loss of an arm and a leg through a train accident at Richmond Station in Melbourne on February the 4th, 2002. Yeah, that's, that's pretty full on Martin you know like you know you've got your disability that you were born with and now going through that acquired journey and that's a that's a whole new struggle in it in itself and trying to adapt to that hey so but I so are you fine talking about just your disability yeah about you know your disability with you know being vision impaired and Oh and yeah, then, and Absolutely. then how, and then how that led into your acquired dis, 
disability with a tram, if you'd be able yeah, to I, right, I think, just going through the sequences of that, mate? Yeah, part of empowerment is to communicate effectively. And one of those things I communicate about is my journey. And it all did begin with being born blind in New South Wales, Curry Curry Hospital. That's K-U-R-R-I twice. And I had a childhood which was full of pathfinding discoveries. And I suppose my parents had the same attitude that I do now, and that is, let's get on with breaking barriers, changing what needed to be. So with my twin brother, who is also blind, living in Alice Springs, he and I and my parents were sent to the integrated school system, refusing to go to one which was segregated. Obviously, I didn't have a say in that. I didn't have a say in that. It was just the way it was with our with our parents because they would have had to travel a long way to collect us and bring us back to school as the like, nearest one was in Sydney. Oh, like, yeah, like a specialised school that catered. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that was the only alternative on, on offer. And it was a boarding arrangement and my parents found that quite unacceptable. So, so with your brother, put, I, are you at the same... Like with your vision impairment, where is is your brother also totally blind or blind. Okay. totally blind? Yeah. Okay. So there was quite a bit of drama through all that. Being the first in New South Wales, we experienced a lot of segregational attitudes, even though we were in an integrated school. Such as there was fear that we'd get hurt, so we were told we couldn't go out and spend playtime with other children there was even a suggestion that we should be in a cage during the break times who well, was that, that suggested by oh the new south wales department of education are you it serious was, oh yeah at the time yeah that was one of the suggestions and, it and didn't ha- that's not even that long ago mate yeah 19 it would have been about 1970 yeah, early 70s. That's then, shocking. Then they said, okay, well, you can stay in the room but not go outside that room. There was a lot of nervousness, a lot of ignorance. A lot how, of, were your par- lot how were your things. parents with this? Were they fearful? Oh, uh, you see, my parents are quite conservative but at the same time determined to create change but within a conservative context so they certainly didn't agree with the cage idea but we were kept inside the classroom during break times for quite a few years then we went to high school on a limited basis it was just a a day or two a year at first and we used able to access braille Yes, my mother, my mother taught herself Braille. Yeah, right. So she actually taught herself so she could teach us, which I think is quite remarkable. That is and remarkable, mate. Eh? So a lot of homeschooling occurred because the schooling at the official schools was very limited until about year seven. And then things really began on a regular basis. Mate, so on a regular basis. So, and that's what I've always been intrigued with, with the language of Braille and, you know, going through that journey because, you know, English being your first language and then having to go down this journey of Braille, how... How would you compare that 
to the English language and learning. Braille. Cert- yeah. Braille is not easy to use. It's not easy to read. It became easy for me, but it's well known that the structure of Braille is not an easy language purely because most of the Braille is in grade two, which is a whole lot of symbols that you must know. So it shortens the Braille. It's like a shorthand. Yep. It shortens the amount, the volume of the book, the book size. So, for example, knowledge is K, not is N, go is G, and we can just go forever on what words have symbols, what denotes various things. So there's a lot you've got to remember. Grade one braille is far less than that. No major contractions, but that does increase the size of the outcome. So the book, the page, turns into pages and the books turn into larger than you can handle. That's why I'm very, very pleased now that digital technologies come along and you can fit it all on your phone, on your iPad, in your computer. Personally, I find it much easier. But I had a lot of my Braille reading speed taken off me because of my train accident. As a result, the braille came at me from the left rather than the right. I didn't uh, realise I was. Yeah, I didn't realise I was so right centric until I lost my right arm, went to read braille, and found that it was so slow. So I pretty well just reduced myself to reading notes now rather than books, as I used to. I used to be a very fluent reader, but now it's so slow okay. that I mainly turn to digital ways of accessing my literature okay and with the braille mate when you're talking about the different grades can you like when you've got a document can are the grades integrated with each other or they're just okay you either got a grade one or grade two or there's even different ones now further than that so you know they're but yeah, no, it's, it's either what people would really say is contracted or non-contracted or abbreviated. They use those terms. Yep. Um, and it's either contracted Braille or it's not contracted Braille. And how many versions are there when I'm talking about, okay, there's Braille coming out of yes. the, Eng- the English language. But when you're talking about all these other nationalities around the world and where Braille fits into that equation... Or is it fit to eat to each language set? There's a lot of work gone into making it universal. Yes. There even used to be a braille called Moon Moon Braille, which had sort of shapes and sort of patterns that were on paper, and that was mainly used for older people. I didn't really get into it too much, and I don't claim to understand it because I don't. But it's really a complex area, but there's a lot of work being done to, to ensure that it's now more universal and integrated no matter what the language is. Interesting. So, yeah, now it's moving into the digital age, but hopefully a lot of youngsters out there that are learning Braille, as, well, that it's still widely available, that it's not too reliant on digital even though yeah that's good and it's all about evolving and upgrading but you know just knowing that base foundation of a braille in case a the network might drop out you know what i mean so there is a sustained effort to ensure that the braille doesn't die yep just like you know it could go the way of people writing handwritten letters newspapers, etc. But there is some determination in our community to ensure its future. I'm not sure how that'll go. It's hard to imagine now being young and learning Braille with the access that we have to digital technology. 
I, I often wonder to myself, which way would I have lent in the end? Mm. Because I only had one choice at that time. And now it's all changed. I, I do feel though that it's still got a lot of practical uses. For example, when I'm being interviewed or doing a speech, yep. I don't often sort of miss not having a note in front of me that I can quietly look at. But I've developed a strategy to cope and it seems to work, but there's no doubt it would be easier if I could have a, a braille note in front of me with the ability to look at key words, etc. But I read so slowly these days that it's, I'd have to concentrate on it that much that it would distract me from what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. So, And how long did it take your mum to learn the language? Oh. Well, you know, <clears throat> I was only five and six, so I don't really recall. But I know she would have had to have worked very hard on it. It's, it would create a lot of time consumption. Very intelligent to be able to to remember it all and then teach it to us. It's yeah. more than remarkable. Oh, yeah. Yeah, putting in the time and effort to make sure that you two young fellas had the right education to learn the That's right. language of Braille because that, were there enough teachers' aides at school that would assist in that part with the education system back then or...? Well, there's not enough teachers aides now, is there? So certainly, <laughs> certainly during that time, we did have a teacher when I went to high school that was in a particular room that we could access. So I don't remember it, too many struggles there for me, but of course that, that, those struggles would have been left primarily with my parents. I know in the days before high school, they had enormous challenges to get the right assistance in order. Yeah. So, and that was all New South Wales, all your schooling. And then did you move down to Victoria when you're in your later teens or how did, where was that whole I, transition? I did. I, I moved to New South uh, Victoria. Yeah. From New South Wales. And that was mainly for for love, if you really want to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're and a sweetheart, so, eh? Oh, uh, well, she was. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so I made a personal decision to move to Victoria for that reason. Yeah, so you've been down there for a while. Mate, I think your video has just dropped out. Can you see? Yeah, see there's it? a call coming in. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Yeah, there's a call coming in. It'll come back when this disappears. Sorry about that. I didn't know it would have that effect. And I had it on Do Not Disturb. So I don't know why it's coming in. No. It'll come back. It should. If it doesn't, I'll fix it. It's all good. We can... Is it... Now that should come oh, back. Oh, boom, boom. He's back. He's back. There you are. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So back it was a here. call coming in and I didn't know. Anyway, part of the adventure. That's it. It's all part of the journey. But That's hey, it. That's good that so we're finally having it. Yeah, yes. you know, missing planes the first time. Now it's people calling us, cutting us off now. Oh, yeah. It's all happening here. <laughs> and, yeah, so moved down to to Melbourne or Victoria for love, mate. So, yeah and, yeah. and so that's where you've been that whole time since. Yeah. Yes. And it's a good place to be because it's a fairly progressive state. The decisions that are made here, I think overall are more in line with our needs than, than in some other states. It, it, it's quicker usually to take on things that are of a progressive nature. I'm not saying it hasn't got its faults because it definitely has. But I, I do feel that the system is more considered here. Yeah, right. So you're just talking about disability systems as a whole or you're talking about general 
Like when you're social talking about the fa- yep, okay, just anything to do with social reform and the and the yeah. fabric of that throughout Australia. You think that Victoria are always leading the charge, hey? Oh, I think Victoria does, in a general sense, lead the way. There'd be people who are hearing me now who are saying, well, "What about this or what about that?" I understand because it's not leading the way in everything, but it's known generally as more progressive and faster to change matters for people on the margins, minority communities, etc. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Very interesting. Come on the rest of you states and territories. Keep yeah, up. That's the way. Yeah, yeah. We don't have well, to go down south. Just stay where we are and get it right. Well, you make it, yeah, so you're making me think in regards to, well, that's where the head office of the NDIA are, down there, down in Geelong there, so. That's right. Mm. There's also TAC, Traffic Mm. Accident Commission, that was first created in Victoria. That's where I get a lot of my funding because of my accident from the TAC. And I can participate in some parts of the NDIS for my total blindness. And Martin, can you talk us through like this devastating injury that had happened to you, mm. and and just the sequence of it, mate? With if you if you don't mind talking about it, like how it happened, and yeah, and, it's fine. Yeah, I was a manager at a workplace in Paran, Melbourne. I'd just arranged a meeting. My wife called me saying that there was some problems with our very young daughter at the time, four months old, that she wanted me to come back and help with. So I cancelled the meeting that I'd just arranged and left, went on a train from Paran to Richmond, walked up the stairs to the platform to get my Next one, which was to travel from Richmond to Box Hill, where I lived. When the train arrived, there was no announcement as to where it was going. Now, I'd heard a couple of announced trains before this one that were not mine. So as I was approaching it, I thought, I wonder where this one's going. I haven't heard destination announcement, but I'll just keep going so as i was moving towards the train i had two things on my mind not just getting on the train but where is it headed i then on approach and getting very close to it reached my cane out and i felt a gap i thought it was a doorway but in fact it was the gap between carriages i fell down there this part I don't actually recall. The passengers saw what had happened. One of them raced up the side of the train to indicate to the driver what had happened. She just got to the driver, opened her mouth to tell him not to move, and he did. And the train went over me and continued on its journey. I was, that woman, by the way, continued to travel down the platform, down a ramp, because in those days, the station staff were not on the platforms. They were underneath. And she actually uttered these words. She said, a man's been killed upstairs. I think you should go up there. Well, some staff went up the stairs and they saw a body on the track about 250 meters down and one of them screamed out he's moving he's moving and they then got down on the tracks at this stage the trains had been stopped the train that went over me was continuing on its journey so the whole train 
well, half of it, well, actually went over me. So how I've survived is millions to one. Then I remember from here on, I remember waking up and hearing radios. I knew something very serious had happened, but I didn't know what. And I immediately said to myself, I don't want to know at this point. The only thing I wanted to know, and I kept asking is, am I going to live? So I was very, very aware that it was serious. I was being asked for my family's phone number and other details. They established then that there was no brain injury out of those questions, apparently. So I don't recall being placed into the ambulance. I understand I was in a very, very life-threatening circumstance for a couple of days. But I used a lot of coping mechanisms I decided to turn very negative feelings into positive ones. For example, I felt that there was flies crawling all over me. There was this feeling that I had flies all over me. I yeah, inquired right. as to why, why there was flies over me. And the nurse kept saying there's no flies. Anyway, in the end, I decided to turn it around to fingers very gentle fingers caressing me. I also was advised that I'd have to, because I've got a lot of burns, very, very serious burns, friction burns from being dragged by the train along the ground. Yeah, oh yeah, because that was a fair distance, so. Yeah, so I was advised that I'd have to stay completely still without scratching, without interfering with the injuries at all for six weeks and at first I thought no way I can't I can't do it but within an hour I decided to say yeah this is pretty relaxing I've got all this time to contemplate my challenge and work out the best way to do it and that's what I'm going to do I remember also being asked by my father-in-law while I was still in the intensive care unit, how I was. And at that stage, I thought with this question, it's a good question and I'm going to give it a good answer. I don't know how long I took to answer, but I said, everything will be fine. And I, I recall very distinctly making a decision to get back to normal life and to do whatever it took to ensure that I did. It was quite an amazing process that happened in that 20 seconds. And I mustered all the strength I could to squeeze his hand to indicate that because I couldn't talk at that time. I had a lot of machinery everywhere, including down my mouth so I couldn't actually talk out and communicate that way but I indicated in the best way possible but I do distinctly remember that moment of decision because I felt that I could have made a decision to relax and die whether that's true or not I don't know but I distinctly remember that feeling I can go or I can stay but if I'm going to stay I'm going to make it a positive existence where I truly am living. And if that's yeah. going to happen, this Power is Power to you, do. brother. Power to you, brother. Well, thank you. It's something that I'm telling because that's how it was. I, I don't know where it comes from. The fact that I survived such an amazing lot of trauma under a train with hundreds and thousands of tons of metal is beyond imagination. So I think it was my lucky day, not my unlucky day. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty full on when it comes to, you know, the certain ways that you could have been dragged or what else it could have done to you. 
and yeah, it's still bloody horrific and being dragged that far and then, you know, and then getting in the hospital and still you feeling that way. If I'm going to get, you know, feeling that you can let go. But at the end of the day, you decided to, you know, to, you know, well, come, also, come back to earth. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have PS. D and any of the oh. things that you would normally expect. I don't know so, why. So you never get any flashbacks at, at all of the, of what happened in that sequence. I took a trans. decision. I took a decision before arriving back home to go and get on a train. The doctors thought I was absolutely mad, but I said, no, I'm actually not mad at all. I just want to connect up with this and get on with the, normal parts of life and therefore that means I'll get on a train and get back home the way that I started. That was the intention and that's what I want to do. Yeah. And how was that journey? Like now, so you want to, your intentions are to, you know, to start, you know, where you were before, which is before yes. the accident and how life operated in that sense. So acquired disability, how was the rehab process and trying to learn to be, to be as able as you can be with your vision impairment, being blind, and now this newly acquired other disability and how to go about life? How was the general transition? Well, it's interesting that you use the word as able as you can be. I remember feeling extremely not well as a result of the medication that I was being prescribed, pain medication in the main. And they came to get me one morning for the next round of rehab. And I said, I'll tell you what, I will go to rehab only if I can withdraw from all of this. And I pointed to all my medications they said, oh, no, you can't, you can't. I said, okay, well, it's one thing or another because I'm telling you, I am not able to do this rehab with all this on board. It is impossible. I am so sick. So I'm making a decision and I'm prepared to sign whatever I need to sign to come off these medications so I can genuinely attach myself to my body which I need to work in order for this rehab to progress me. So I did. I went off all the medication and, of course, it was painful. But as I said to them, that's the only way I'm going to know what is and what is not hurting what I need to do in order to work around it, work with it. And that's how I did things from that day on. And that's what made the difference. The you, ability you don't to mark feel, around. Uh, ah, yeah. well, the ability to feel things that were going on or not right or whatever was far better than it being masked by a drug that was making or drugs that were making me very, very sick. Yeah, I know how you feel in that sense. Well, with those certain drugs, and you know, where you, you feel like they're weighing you down, and you don't want to feel that that fog. You know, and plus That's being it. able and being able to feel, and talking about being able to feel. So w whether it be prosthetics or what the technology that they had back then to get you to move forward. So what did you utilize for, like, well, now taking I, on this newly acquired disability? I couldn't wear an arm. Um, I don't know if you can see in the picture. Yeah. There's a lot that's see. been taken. As as there was so much taken, I couldn't have an arm, an unofficial one. There were medical people who said that I would not know where it was either because I couldn't see it. So there was a disadvantage there they were concerned about. I'm not sure about that because I think I might have been able to feel where it was or associate with it eventually. But it couldn't be because of how much was lost. I've got my artificial leg, which I use every day. That can be operated with 
an app as well to change the surface, the way it reacts, etc. Yes, I remember my first day at rehab and very fortunate for me, there was a visitor that came to see the main person, the main practitioner. And I heard him walk quite swiftly across the floor with an artificial leg. And I said, okay, that's how it's done. And I'm going to do whatever it takes in order to do that myself. So I was very much into attaching myself to positive examples. I asked the hospital to arrange someone to come in to see me with similar injuries and they did. And we had a good chat and I learned a lot from that. So I am very big on doing it yourself in initiating your own system in accordance with your own personality. You should not just sit and wait for others to come to you. you. You are the best judge of your own body, yourself, and go with the way you naturally feel. Yeah, that's right. You know, you know, you know, you at the end of the day and the way that yes. you're going to react to certain technology that's supposed to help you moving forward. And c yes. Can you take us through the technology that you're utilizing now? You were talking about an app which can help out yes. the prosthetic yes. in a certain way. How, how does that work? Oh, uh, it can adjust it if you're walking up the stairs or down the stairs. It can adjust the way, the trajectory, I guess, the trajectory of the way that the foot is anticipating what you're walking upon. Yes. And it can be sent a signal as to what type of surface you're on. I don't use it a lot purely because I'm happy with the basic method that it uses but there are times when you're on sharp inclines stairs etc where it is helpful i use different types of technology to communicate it's amazing how rapidly that's moved along mm. the way we're doing this meeting now for example yeah that's it and have you seen a bit of a shift and a change because i'm thinking along the lines of like not too long ago, even and still now, disability equipment and assistive technology in general, the price tags on anything that had disability on it and do, the prices are right up there. But when you're looking at the likes of Google, Alexa, Siri, Zoom, all a lot of these mainstream tech, does does that apply to your everyday use as someone that's vision impaired and, and with your yeah. other acquired disability? Yes, it does. It does. And we're forever working on it being accessible. Sometimes an app is accessible and then they update and it's broken and you have to go back to the drawing board. It's all about the culture of these large companies and smaller ones, people in general. As I've always said to any developer, pass these learnings on. The ones where we've worked together to create this accessible app that was not at the beginning, please pass on what you've come to know. I don't want it to be a momentary improvement because you are here. I want it to be a sustained inclusive accessible influence in your app developing from now on the culture please work on your culture so talking about the culture right have you personally been involved with any app developers or any sort of tech in general for people that are vision impaired blind all the time yeah, all the okay. time yes and i always believe in where possible and of course it's quite difficult at the moment with social distancing 
I don't call it social distancing, I call it what it is, and that's physical distancing. I think we're actually socially a bit closer these days with all these Zoom meetings that are happening. But these days it's a bit harder to do what I like to do, and that is actually physically get to the developers, show them the experience of being totally blind, and the experience of, of hearing, of listening, rather than seeing and making your decisions and judgments on site. You've got to, in our case, make them upon what you are hearing. That's great. And what other technology have you worked on, mate, apart from if it not what you can obtain in a phone or a computer? Yes. PC, Mac, whatever it may be. Just any... I'm talking about the open general landscape. If it's yeah, to sure. Do, I remember. Yeah, or travel because you're a staunch, you're a staunch disability advocate, advocate, and, and kangaroo supporter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so just well, lead us down remember, that path, mate. Yeah, sure. I sorry for talking over there. I remember in around mid 80s perhaps this is dealing with technology but i at first was dealing with it in a less technical fashion i confronted a situation where there was no announcements under what we call the city loop in melbourne's train system there was no announcements at all so I spoke to them and spoke to them and spoke to them again and they were not listening. So I thought I would make my own announcements. So I went down underneath where the city loop stations are with Katie Ball. A few people may remember Katie Ball. She was a very active activist. And she told me what trains were there and I was announcing them through a megaphone. I thought I'd make the announcements that should be being made. Anyway, I got arrested three times for disturbing the peace. I thought, that's disturbing the peace. This is actually adding a service. That's, Mate, I've, 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 heard you're, I've heard you're a bit of a troublemaker. So. Oh, well, sometimes you've got to stir the pot. That's it, shake After it up. After third time... Yeah, well, after the third time, they realised that I wasn't going anywhere. And they did exactly what I was asking them to do originally. And that's, they came to Brisbane with me to look at the technology that they were using. So they were pretty forward thinking then. And that was a train locator system, which allowed the announcements on the Brisbane's trains, on the Brisbane trains a lot earlier than anywhere else. And they came back to Melbourne and copied that. And I was later to be in the testing program. And now we have those beautiful announcements right through the loop. That occurred probably about six months after they came back with me from looking at Brisbane. Mm. Yeah, so Graham Innes, he went through a, a similar story to yours yes. at X Disability. Human That's Rights it. Commissioner, he, yeah. Up, up the, only thing, the only thing he didn't get out there and make any announcements, he didn't have to do that, but he, he had his own effective megaphone in his own different way. And, of course, he had a higher profile at that time, which I didn't have. I have now, thankfully. But then, in those days, I was a very unknown that became known through doing things a little differently to create points and progress what needed to be in order to make our lives of a higher quality. That's it, mate. It's not about being boxed in, being out in the grey area and, you know, yes. what you can see from your perspective that's going to have and give change to a lot of people out there. So... Even My activism really started in the industrial relations area in supported employment services services, and I was very very, very dissatisfied with what I noticed there, and I was to 
create a movement called Penny, People for Equality, not Institutionalization, who advanced forward and created a lot of pub publicity in order to to create changes in that area, to, to have the wages and conditions that were being experienced by other workers passed on. There's still a lot of work to do in that area, by the way, because it slipped back a lot. But I did strongly believe that it was akin to slave labour, where people with disabilities were being used, and that is an appropriate word, used, because they certainly weren't being paid in a real sense, to, for example, fill show bags that were being sold at an inflated price when the people that were being used to fill them were being virtually not paid at all to do it. Sweatshop type arrangements with no legitimate positive conditions. It was appalling. So there were protests at the showground. We called cabaries. Remember the ads, a glass and a half of pure cream milk? Well, we called it a glass and a half of pure slave sweat that produced these that's, cabaries. I, that's absolutely back. disgusting that that was going on. Yes, it was. Yeah, because there's still forms still of that is. going today. Correct. Well, you know, you know, when you're looking at some of the Australian disability enterprises and the way that some of them are run around the country and yes. the hours that some of these people are putting in and the, the little returns, you know, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. They need to, yeah. the agency needs to get on board. People need to get on board and make change within that sector. So I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it unionized to mm. really get, people united and together the problem is though is that by the nature of some disability groups they are kept isolated and not encouraged by anyone and it's having the funding to too it's having the money to get behind them and the resources so yeah you know that's right. But it's better that we've got a lot of technology like this these days so anybody can broadcast a message and That's you don't right. have to be here, there and everywhere. You can do it from from home or wherever on your phone, whatever it may be. But, yeah, in we need... In some situations... Yeah. In some, sorry, Jake. In some situations... You're right, you're right. The, the individuals concerned are not aware that unions exist. So it's very hard to educate someone about unions if they're not aware of why they exist and the value of them that would be brought to them by joining one. Well, that's it. When you look at the majority of Australia's pay structures or just how they're looked after annual leave, super, all of that, if we didn't have certain unions back in the day and how they operated and what they instilled in the Australian fabric of looking after the workers and pay structures, we wouldn't be in certain positions today for sure. Correct. Yes. Mate, so, the other thing. so what are you thinking about starting a, a disability union or an advocacy group or are you a part of certain ones now that you might be able to, kick up a gear and, and, you know, keep leading the charge and broadcasting the message or what? Well, I was a union president for 14 years. So to some degree, I've had a career there and now I'm a national advocacy officer for BCA. I certainly would be interested in encouraging and getting behind people who were interested as far as initiating it, though, and sort of running in an executive of an organisation like that, 
I'm probably wanting to hand that on to someone else, but I, without doubt, would like to assist, support, and encourage someone. Yep, yep. Hey, Martin, brother, would you be able to just shift the phone a little bit back towards your... Up right? or down? No, to, to the left. Well, you tell me when I'm doing yep. this the that way. Spot on, mate. Looking nice Beautiful. and pretty. Looking nice and pretty okay. there. All, all good. <laughs> all good. <laughs> yeah. So it's really good to know you, we got people like yourself in these areas that are trying to do what's right for the people to get. Because if no one says anything, no, nothing gets done, and we just need yes. to keep, keep the charge, keep going, keep moving forward, and trying to get a collective of people with disability we've lived experience or not to keep, you know, because you're looking at a lot of these advocacy groups and they're like losing funding and dropping out. And we just, we just need to keep vocalizing and making sure that we can reach into the right resources. That's right. So we can bring, break some of these systemic cycles and which it's Australia in general is making improvements when it's got to, do with disability but you know that we still need to keep moving forward because a lot still needs to be done for the whole disability spectrum across australia oh, so and it's all a positive i'm a very positive person however i need to point out with that positivity in mind which should produce proactive acting that this country is doing very poorly when it comes to many important areas, employment and social housing, vital areas where we are doing so poorly, so badly. And then and is this, is this purely on, purely on disability yet? Or are you talking about the whole? I'm afraid. I'm referring Structure. to disability. Okay. okay. I'm referring to disability in this case. Yep. yep. I'm not saying it's not there because it's there, but what's there and what's needed are very different. So we need to keep it going. The The unemployment rate is appalling. It is, and mate. That, yeah, and it's just a perception of what, you know, with employers, you know, just... You know, they or they already got this notion, this subconscious bias sitting in the back of the head. As soon as this person applies for that role, if it's on paper or sitting down with the interview because of their disability, that they're just not up to scratch or they're not going to be able to do right. X, Y, and Z. So, yeah. which makes me sick because I've, you know, I've physically seen it before in the past and we need, and where does, in your point of view, and we haven't even touched on the National Disability Insurance Scam, the NDIS. Where does, where does this fold into this situation and how can it assist? It can assist in many ways. I, I think if it's assisting in the area of, of housing with the SDAs that they've got now, Specialised Disability Accommodation, as well as providing the technology, the everyday supports, which of course creates independence. That in turn creates a better feeling about yourself, commonly known as self-esteem, which then has a person confident enough to want to work and even more confident to do the work. So I think it has flow on effects. Starting from the Every, roof over your head, that would yes. then eventually lead into employment and beyond. So is that what you think should be in place? Like there should be more emphasis on housing which would end up leading into, you know, because 
you know, having a roof over your head, having that, that comfort of, you know, being able to look after yourself, live independently as much as you can with whatever disability you may, may have, which would end up leading into a path of employment of some sort. So is that where and what you're talking about, Martin? Absolutely. And accommodation and assistance with supports that allows the person to flourish beyond their homes that they were brought up in. Parents are wonderful, should be respected. All those things I understand. But sometimes, as a matter of fact, in the disability space, very often they are not able to let go. And that mm. actually can be a major retardant to the person's development from a child to an adult and an adult that can flourish mm. in the employment space. And for example, if an employer sees that the parent is still a major factor in that person's life, they automatically are reduced in the possibility of gaining the employment because they know they're going to have to deal with the person and the parent. Now, I'm not knocking parents here. They are an extremely valuable component of most of our lives. But how much involvement is the point? Yeah, I, I agree. And it also going the opposite way too, where you're talking about where they do let go. But I'm thinking, look, I'm just touching on what I've personally seen, where parents are either passed away or out of the equation and where that person with disability can't, look after themselves. They don't know how to navigate the, any human services, anything to do with Centrelink, their general care, or it's very upsetting accessing anything, you know, just knowing how to go to the general store, like pick up groceries, whatever it may be. And where you see the majority of these people that have mental intellectual cognitive disabilities and they end up on the streets and they end up homeless and there's a high percentage of people coming through that do come in that situation and and that's where where we can make a difference there too and i know like you're going to have some people to say you know with maybe if it's under the ndis or other other schemes or whatever it may be they'll you know i've heard people say it's not an answer to homelessness it's not an answer to homelessness but it Eddie, like when people are in these situations where they can't fend them for themselves because they're not cognitively aware of day-to-day -day operations as a human being, yes, we need to get the appropriate housing sorted and supports around them so they can, you know, live an independent life as much as they can. If you can have the supports to help teach these people because they've never learned it appropriately because if they've been going through their whole life without being taught certain things and then their parents drop off now what and that's the product of over doing it when it comes to parenting there is cases of course where the person's disability is so profound and has such an impact that that person will require a high level of all kinds of care, including parental care for the rest of their lives from the beginning to the end, or if it's an acquired injury through a major accident, etc. I understand that. I'm talking about the circumstances where a person is held back by an overzealous parental approach, which Un yeah. Understood. This allows yeah. this allows the development of that child. Some parents just simply like to be needed 
and they actually hold on to that rather than having the needs of their child number one. They think of the, their needs first, their need in this case to be needed. Now, once again, I'm not critical of this. I understand very much how this posture, parental posture, comes about. It comes about in lots of cases because of a social non-acceptance of a baby coming into the world that has a disability. So there's a combination of shock, in some cases shame, sadly. But what does that produce? It produces protectiveness. It does. You do. That, I have that, seen that case a few, like a fair few times where they the kid or the adult, you know, they have that protective shield over them and wear yes. it. And then it's that person regresses in certain situations where mm. they can't be independent and flourish where or they either, could if they're directed in certain situations, you know. So they either regress or they stay in that childlike position. Mm. And this is very sad and you see it all the time as understandable as it is, you as a parent need to work out a way through to not doing it. The, the other thing I'll say so what, is- what would your message be? Like you're a parent, Martin. So what would, you know, without, you know, you, being straightforward without- Yes. Not trying well, to hurt I, the, the mums and dads yeah. out there, but what would your message be from your perspective and you've got a disability yourself? So what yes. would be your message? My message would be, I understand why you can't let go, but I want you now to understand why you should and must let go in order for your child to be maximised, not minimised, in order for your child to flourish, not remain static to become the best they can be to mm -hmm. produce actions of their own to be independent in the way they vote to what they wish to eat to who they want to associate with and it flows on to all other areas, employment, etc., etc. It just mm -hmm. they must be given the right to choose to be and to become. So going back into social reform and where you've been a staunch advocate in that circle, and where we're talking one of the biggest biggest social reforms coming through recently which is you know well it's not too new it's been out for a few years now which is the national disability insurance scheme what's your take on it and do you think and where is it where is it now where does it sit with you of how it operates and works and what do you think and where it could go in the future to benefit people oh, I, with disability in a general sense, I think it is a well overdue reform. I see some dangers, however. For example, if it becomes abused by service providers and even participants to the point where the costs blow out, there is a real danger that the taxpayer will stigmatise the whole thing, will attack the overall notion of it simply because it's our money that's going into it. This is, this is the taxpayer talking mm. and we believe it's been wasted. That will lead potentially to people with disabilities being regarded as 
an unfortunate burden. Why did we go into this? You cost us so much. So there is a real danger there if it's not done properly that it actually causes what it's trying to prevent. I think regarding its, its, its operation in general, there is no doubt that we are better off for it than without it. But there are a lot of service providers who are registered charities who are triple dipping. They're getting some money from the person, particularly in the My Age Care case. They're getting money from the system, the NDIS or My, My Age Care, and they're getting money from the charitable dollars that used to cover a lot of these services. Mm. And I'm really concerned that what effect is it going to have on, on people's kindness? I am not against charity, but I am for people being offered the opportunity to support services, mm. not in a charitable sense, but in a social giving sense. I'm concerned about the effect and impacts upon that happening, where the general public says, well, my tax dollars are already going into the NDIS, so I won't be giving that organisation my financial support because it, they don't need it anymore. So I think there's going to be a drain in that area. At the same time, I don't want the service providers to be taking advantage of the charitable dollars they get and they're still getting, but all of a sudden, they're also asking for huge dollars from the NDIS for the same thing that they're getting charitable dollars for. Yeah. It's so crazy. I just, I, I just wonder, I just wonder at times where's, where's the money really going to when there's still the same amount of charitable dollars in some cases being dragged in at the same time, there's the NDIS, which are being pushed and pushed and pushed to, to charge a lot of money for the services. I mean, I, I know people who are having to pay $193 per hour for technology support. $193 per hour for someone to simply tell them how to work their iPad, etc. And yet the organisation concerned is still receiving charitable dollars as well. So we've got to sort out what is what here and make sure that all of it can still remain, including the NDIS's costs. I spoke to them two weeks ago and I said, please find a way. Was that, the, keep... was that the local local office or was it a, a particular group in the agency or? Oh, no, I was speaking in front of the executive leadership team. So it was all the leaders. And I, I said to them, you must find a way to bring the service price down so you can increase the services you can provide. At the moment, it's blowing out, blowing out, blowing out, but the service provision is now starting to become more and more questioned because of how much it's costing. Somehow you've got to get those costs down so you can increase the level of service provision itself. Yeah. De or else it's depending on which, yeah, depending on which line items they are, because there's so you know there's so many different groups. Yes, correct. I met reg registered groups underneath the NDIS as in the services themselves like there are some that are way blown out, but there's some Jake, where... It's going to become, it's going to become mm. unaffordable. We, we, we will not be able to afford it. And I fear the day... You mean when... Australians won't be able to afford it? Yeah, that's what you're talking about because it's going to blow out. Is that where you... Correct. Get... And, and I'm mm. concerned about the reaction to people with disabilities on the street with the taxpayer 
realizing that we are costing so much because there wasn't a reasonable cap placed upon the amount of money that the providers were asking for. I know that the providers are pushing very hard for price increases all the time. And you say to yourself, you can't just keep wanting more and more and more because it's at our expense. It's yeah. at our expense. I know, yeah. what you're saying. And, and, and even with myself, like I'm an NDI service provider myself, and I can yeah. obviously see what's in there. But like, there's so many, and what makes me sick with this is that there's so many sharks in the water. Like, correct the amount correct. the amount of new service providers that I see pop up, and where I've personally been involved with direct service provision, or with myself, or clients, or friends, people that I know, where they just get taken advantage of. Like, you know, I've had $8,000 ripped out of my personal package and th yeah. these people ended up getting found out because I was dipping into, yeah, a lot of people's pack. Uh, they didn't even sign up with me. They, they, I didn't even know who they were, didn't have a service agreement, no nothing. Well, is, and then, and then all I'm of it, and there's stuff like this happening left, right and centre. So it's good, that, it's good that we've got the Quality and Safeguards Commission in place. So... We've got that yeah. whole team that can come down and deregister and get like bringing the legal force to get behind and just smash these bloody providers in the head and get them out of here. Absolutely. So there because... should be an an A triple C type setup where the costs are always made as common as possible, rather than you know you can charge what you like. It's it's really worrying me that there will be a blowout because that will affect our, our social standing, I guess, is the mm. way that I'd like to put it. If we become a financial burden, the public is going to take it out and say that each of us are a burden. And, and believe me, that will, that will, mean that people turn against us whether it be socially or whether we want a job etc because they'll say well you're already getting this why should i give you more why should i offer you a job and pay you more than what you're already receiving through the ndis which is cleaning out my taxes yeah i understand it from that point of view so like it is but so we've gone down that route Oh, by the way, I just want to say, Pos I just want to say, yeah. I'm not in any way talking about reduction of services. As a matter of fact, I think they should have an even broader range. Oh, of we, and we and we need more. Like when you're talking yeah. about, you know, like in some of the areas, like there's plenty of spots around, you know, where I am in New South Wales or just throughout the nation in general, where there is lack of service provision. It's hard to get them in some places when you're talking about rural and remote. Like there's certain ways that you can move and shake and get things done in respect to those areas which still need working on and continuously need that you know reinforcement in those areas but people are starting to move out of cities and move into these areas too which is great where because yes. you're looking at most of the capital cities around in australia especially sydney like good luck you know you know trying to buy down there and even where you are down in melbourne like the prices are just keep inflating so yes the prices but, um, of, of products and services mm -hmm. in the disability area so right yeah yeah and but mate going to positives of the ndis so oh, what yes. what can you draw what can you draw upon that and tell us mate oh, i think the the fact of it the social outcomes where people are being supported to simply go out and have a cup of coffee, let alone to employment, education, having access to services, products, technology, et cetera, et cetera. The concept of NDIS is extraordinarily positive and I'm totally in favour of its existence and want to support its maintenance. So I'm all for the NDIS in so many different ways and for so many different reasons. That's why I'm involved in 
the shaping of it. Mm -hmm. Soon we'll have an app which we'll all be able to work with, which I think may be a game changer. Oh, can, can you tell us a little bit about it or is it top secret or what? Oh, uh, well, I, I think I can tell you and your listeners. And, and, viewers. View, and viewers, mate, yep. And talking yep, about I, you, just, just yes. shift, shift the camera a little bit to your right, if you can. Uh, right. Okay. Where's my stand? Okay. How's that? Or did yeah. I go in the wrong direction? No, nah, no, nah, that was the right direction. Brilliant. Sitting, Good enough. Yeah, sitting pretty again, mate. You're all right. Thank you. Yeah. So the app. Well, the NDIS is currently developing an app, which I've been involved with. And we're hoping that it will be released maybe July, August. It is July now, I know. If not, you know, by the end of the year, where we will be able to access things in a lot more focused way. They are working upon an instant payment system as well, where you'll be able to pay in real time. So you go to your service provider and through the app, you'll be it able to. It doesn't matter if you're plan managed, self managed, or plan managed, or probably better if you were self managed. But with the plan management part, that'll be integrated somehow. It might be a few, a step or two more. But the general reason for the app's creation is so a person can more directly target their own plan and get out of it more quickly what is in it there'll be contacts to well we're suggesting there should be and i have not seen a barrier to it yet to your lack or planner and you'll be able to have on your phone faster access rather than going through you know, all the my gov channels, etc. That's the aim. That's the reason. And hopefully that's the outcome of this app. The instant real time payment system, I think, will allow you to not need any more to take it out of your own funds first. If you're self managed, it'll go directly from the in the NDIS's account. Mm, so brilliant in the works, hey? Well, hopefully yeah. that it comes out and it's a positive step forward and, you know, oh, that's going to... Yeah, and it's going to help the masses out there being able to access it appropriately and being able to manage their funds and whatever it may be. But so Just remember, when it comes yep. out at first, it won't have all of its functionality. That's the way things are in this space yeah so it'll still be in its beta, beta form and then it'll come out in a more yes pol polished version soon yeah correct correct and even when it comes out more suggestions that come in the more it will progressively improve that's great mate well it's good to hear that martin that a few good positive things are coming out of the ndis and hopefully that trajectory just keeps going forward but it's like any system like and i've said this many a time like yeah it's going it's in a positive line going forward but there's always going to be you know ups and downs and you know hills and valleys along the way but you know we're getting there and having people like yourself in there telling the the people that are sitting in the ivory towers like and the executive directors and whoever else is involved with the disability reform councils and people like that, just letting them know people like us that have disability is, you know, bringing it to them and with our different spectrums, whether it's got to do with vision impaired, quadriplegia. When I spoke to them recently, I encouraged them to return to the face to face sessions 
as quickly as possible for the participants I, reference group. Okay. Are you still involved with the participant yes, reference group? Yes, I am. Yes. That's good. And the reason I used was that every time we travel, every time we are brought together, it's every time you are exposed directly to what our needs are. Because you get to find out, you have exposure immediately to our traveling experience, our accommodation experience, what we need to do each and every day is there in front of you just to organize these meetings. Mm. And I think that's an important component of understanding and indeed empathy and education to you, the NDIS, your staff and people down the line. You get to see it, feel it and know it. And talking about seeing, feeling and know it. So that's with travel. When you got someone that's with your disability, when you're talking about getting on planes, like whatever carrier organisation it may be, what's, yes. is, does it work out really well for someone in your situation? Like the actual steps of to the airport, getting onto the plane and if it's any sort of announcements or whatever aids that they got within airports themselves? It's amazing how many times you book and explain the meet and greet and what your requirements are, but it just doesn't get to the point where you need it to. And you need to re-explain it again for priority boarding, et cetera, et cetera. It just never gets to, to the area where it needs to. And I understand that to some degree because there'd be so much information that needs to be taken into account during the boarding process, the ticketing requirements, et cetera, et cetera. But I think the coordination of the information could be a lot more arranged. I feel that you should be able to register with a particular, like say, for example, if you're a Qantas frequent flyer, you should be able to register as a person who just automatically requires priority boarding, meet and greet services, etc. And that just simply be not having to be mentioned anymore unless you want that status to be changed. Mm. And it just automatically appears on your ticket, etc., etc. But it's so ad hoc currently. And you can you can tell the operator at the other end of the phone as much as you like. It never gets to the people on the ground. That, that will end up meeting and greeting you and offering you the service. You have to continuously repeat it all the time. And have you ever had to use a guide dog in general, like in general or in an airport situation or anything like that? Yes. Yes, I have. I've had two dogs over the years. I have operated through airports, on planes, in hotels, restaurants, etc. The biggest problem is taxis, followed by restaurants. And I find hotels okay, I, you know, but I do know through being an advocate that some aren't. There's this idea that's come out where hotels will advertise themselves as pet friendly or not pet friendly. And when they say they're not pet friendly, they, in some cases, say, well, I said you couldn't come because we advertise as pet friendly and you spend a lot of time saying, no, this is not a pet. This is an assistance dog, different. Mm -hmm. But the way they see it, they advertised that dogs, pets couldn't come, and therefore yours shouldn't. And they see it as undermining their, their advertisement. Like if our visitors see you with a dog, they'll wonder why we couldn't bring ours. Well, it's because it's an assistant dog, guys. <laughs> 
that's that just drives me nuts when I hear it's yeah. you know it's utilizing this animal to get you from A to A to B. It's not just your standard you know house pet dog that you yeah. know you know and the the you know the thousand hundreds thousand hours that need to be put into these dogs to get them trained up to so they're yeah. fully equipped to be in your possession so and then obviously yeah, well, i think compatible non- with pet. you too so well the does, it ta- does it take is it hard though like what like taking over as as a handler at first with a, with a guide dog well it's funny you should say that i was being asked to describe that a couple of weeks ago and I said it was at a human rights commission hearing and I was asked to make an opening statement on behalf of someone who had been prevented from going into a restaurant. And I said, I remember the days, the very early days with my first dog and I took my first steps out on my own with the dog. And I wondered why I was doing this. Why and how can I trust a dog rather than a person to guide me? And you sort of have this sort of superiority belief at that time that, oh, human beings, they can be trusted. They can move about. But an animal, an animal, is, is an animal actually going to stop me from falling onto a train track is an animal going to stop me from hitting a telegraph pole a tree etc etc after a while you get to understand that they can be trusted and are actually a little better at sighted guide as we call it than human beings in a lot of cases because they have this sort of instinctive intuitive way of avoiding things not just the training, it's just their instinct. But at first, it is a major process of handing over such trust to an animal when you are so used to being guided when you're not moving about independently by a person. So yes, it certainly is a major transition process that feels very strange at first. And do they have to be reassessed like once every year or something like that? Yes, it it goes on actually in the early stage much more than once a year. I think it's a six-month check these days. Mm. And that's fairly intensive and necessary because it's just as much about the handler as what it is about the dog. Mm. And what's the average lifespan, not of the breeder dog, but the lifespan of it operating as a guide dog for someone that's vision impaired? Yeah, because in the main, they are thoroughbred dogs. They actually have a, a, you wouldn't think so, would you? Because they're thoroughbred, but because of that, they have a lower lifespan. So as such, you get uh, eight to 10 years if you're lucky. After about eight years, the dog's about 10 by then. When they start getting to 11 and 12, yeah, they they rarely last Mm. in a working, productive working sense beyond about the 11th year. I'm aware that some people are going to be saying, my dog's 12 or 13. Yeah, I can see ya. You dropped him. I can see ya. What a beauty. I'll just... (laughs) I'll hold it like this. How's that? That's fine. If you just bring it down a touch, that's it. Beautiful. Well, that creates a bit of fun. That's all good. That's it. We're making it work. (laughs) Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I kicked the stand over. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's all good. So... Yeah. So with the dogs too, so is there a wide availability or yeah, there's a pretty long waiting list in general for guide dogs? Uh, I'm not up with how long the waiting lists are, but I, I think anything from three to six months 
is about the average. There's services in most states and there's around all up about three different organisations. Yeah, okay. Mate, well, I want to jump in that, like, just yourself, how you feel, like, I'm talking about the current climate, environment, yes. COVID-19, COVID how have you been? Have you been safe? Do you know anybody that's been affected? Like, because Melbourne's been, or oh, Victoria, so, sorry, has been copping a hiding from the get-go, like, out of any state or territory. So, how are you going well, with it all? I'm going all right. I I have a very practical attitude to just about anything, so I, I just take it as it comes. But I will say the social distancing, as it's called, but it's really physical distancing, is a very difficult concept for blind people because we are used to touching and necessarily are very tactile. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, exactly that, the tactility of how you go about life. Yeah, it's tricky. One. Well, well, we, I, I'll tell you, I have definitely found it hard to be independent rather than supported because there's all these markers on floors and appropriate queuing techniques that respect the physical separation that you just can't do. Even guide dogs can't really, I mean, they're not trained. They haven't been trained for social distancing. So they're not aware of keeping any distance. Mm. They're just operating. They've been trained for years and years. If this becomes the new norm, if we can't find a vaccine, I'm sure they will be trained that way. But at the moment, it's business as usual, and they certainly are not aware of distances that they need to keep so yeah it's it's quite different it's quite for some intimidating i've had a lot of advocacy calls on this level yeah. public transport requirements where you can't you can't go in one door or out another yeah. even in i was at mcdonald's and you went in a particular door and you had to go out another door and you know it's very hard to keep up with it all and locate these differences that are now there it is impacting upon those that are independent in a very big way yeah that's for sure and even with myself being a quadriplegic because with having not a hundred percent lung capacity and just where COVID attacks the respiratory system. That's where, you know, I, that's where the anxiety builds up there. But, you know, yes. we just got it. We can't be complacent. This thing hasn't, hasn't gone. And as we can see now, there's a bit of a second wave that's been yes. flowing through. So we just need to make sure that we keep safeguards in place with a lot of these people with disabilities. So, and, uh, you know, because we don't want people with disabilities going into hospital too. So I know well, I know some people that have gone in hospital and they just don't want them there where it's got to do with people that might have their immune system's not up, up, up to scratch, you know, due to their disability or whatever, or whatever it yeah. may be. They've got some sort of lung issue or, or age and the hospitals are just... Yeah, I know they would have been in there longer if... COVID wasn't around. Yes. So, but um, it's starting to be a little bit more relaxed, but who knows where it's going to be going in the next few weeks if New South Wales is going to start locking down. on Because like, they've only just started to reopen hours on certain situations, yeah. whatever it's got to do with health, health retail or whatever it may be. So I don't know how long that's going to last, like depending on the numbers and the growth if it's going yes. to keep on going on a trajectory on the way up. But, yeah, yeah hopefully it sort of phases out and, we, you know, a vaccine hopefully it does come at the end of the year. But you never know. Who knows? But we've got all these countries that are, you know, working on it with all these research teams all over, all over the world just trying to 
come up with a vaccine and so we can disperse it across the world and, you know, jab this stuff in and, and hopefully, you know, we can go out and be as normal as possible as the way it was before this thing hit. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, mate, well, Martin, I really appreciate you coming on for the first episode of keep rolling through Zoom which is, you know, it's exciting and it's another step and another avenue. So, and, you know, I should have this out soon. But, mate, did you want to give a shout out or just acknowledge or put out there any of the organisations that you're working with or whether it's any, uh, if you've got social media accounts that you want to put out there? Well, firstly, I want to say thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to your audience, the people who are following this app, because these podcasts provide an opportunity to gain information, to to hear each other's experiences and to feel less alone if we were feeling alone. And if we're not feeling alone, it allows us to thrive even further through the knowledge that is gained by listening to others give their knowledge, to share it. It's important, it is so important that we gain each other's skills and hear of our experiences because that's what builds our confidence, knowing that what we're experiencing is being experienced by others, what we're feeling is being felt. And even if we're not, you gain the empathy from hearing what others are going through. And there's so many positives. I do believe in life and living and every day that I breathe is a good one. I think that's part of being a person with a disability because we learn very quickly in order to move about effectively to be positive. And for those who aren't feeling positive today, please know that you can and that it is possible to meet your challenges by listening to podcasts like this and to gain the confidence through the words and through the knowledge that you've heard. Not exclusively one person, but all of us together. We all form a part of a contribution to each other's lives. So thank you. We at Blind Citizens Australia, we we provide services for blind or vision impaired Australians anywhere in the country. We're not confined to one state. And if you ever have a problem in any respect with the feeling of being discriminated against or just simply need a chat, we're there. So please give us a call, Blind Citizens Australia, otherwise known as BCA. And thank you everyone for listening and watching. See, preach brother, love your words. You know, well, and yeah. just what you put out there about everybody raising together, as I say, well, you know, high, if, high tide raises all canoes. That's it, well, brother. I've got a saying that I always live with, and that is if there doesn't appear to be an opportunity, create one. That's it. Live large and take charge. Well, thanks again, no. Martin. And hopefully... Down in Victoria with COVID and the numbers rising up, hopefully that settles out soon. You be safe. And yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll, and I'll my, see you around. I'll do my best not to spread it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certainly, I, I stay at home a fair bit. I'm actually lucky, you know, because I don't. No, are you serious? Have you, have you got it or what? No, 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 no. Oh, no. Jesus Christ, you're scaring I'm, me now. It, so I won't spread it. I'm going to be staying at home a bit more than going out. But, ah, right. You know, 
yeah, I knew it had a double meaning, and you 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 targeted it beautifully. Well done. Uh, <laughs> now I got it, um, but you know, if I did have it, I know what I'd do, and hopefully I won't. But if I did have it, I, I would still look upon it as positively as I can. That's it. Just leave that positive lifestyle, brother, and just keep that moving forward. And you take care. Only one way to go. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Jake. Thanks, mate. Bye. See perseverance. Born blind, vision impaired. Life's rolling on. Bang. Double disability. Limbs ripped off. Doesn't matter. Keep moving forward. That's Martin. Great advocate. Voice for the people. And he'll continue to do so. He's a top bloke, eh? And if you want to get in contact with me, you can get me via Instagram, at Street Rolling Cheetah, or email one word, Street Rolling Cheetah, at gmail.com. Or I also got a Facebook page, Keep Rolling with Jake Briggs. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, hit that subscribe button. It'd be much appreciated. I want to thank our sponsors, Permobil Australia, the greatest electric wheelchairs in the land. Wouldn't be sitting in anything else but these four wheels right here. And they've got great assistive tech also. So, Ida, we'll see you on the next one.